Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabiya na Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'd habita fillah continue on in our study of tahara and prayers basic fiqh uh, we reach the point where Imam Sa'id ibn Fuzan, Hafizullah Ta'ala, he mentions about the things that uh, your ritual imp your ritual ritual impurity prohibits doing. Meaning, uh, those things when you don't have tahara that you cannot do. Especially, uh, so anyhow, uh, and of course the scholars of fiqh, they they disagree over uh, some of these messiahs, some of these issues. But anyway, we're going to present it as Imam Fulzan, half of Allah Ta'ala, presents it and try to benefit from what the Imam says. He says, there are some deeds which Muslims are prohibited to perform unless they are in a state of pur purity, tahara, due to the greatness and loftiness of these deeds, like prayer, uh, fasting, uh, holding the Qur'an, etc. Uh, what follows is a discussion of these deeds accompanied with the related proofs, with Adillah. You know, he's not speaking from his desires. He's speaking with Adillah from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah, the Message of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So as to familiarize the reader with such deeds and not to perform any of them unless he or she is in a state, uh, is in the proper state of purity. Furthermore, there are deeds that one in a state of ritual impurity be it major or minor, is prohibited to do. On the other hand, there are some deeds specifically prohibited only for those in a state of the major uh, ritual impurity. So he first begins, the first thing, he said deeds prohibited for one in a state of minor or major ritual impurity. He says first, touching the glorious book of Allah, meaning the Quran. So this is one of the issues that I said, uh, you know, that the scholars differ with regards to the Adillah, and we'll try to have a very brief discussion about it. So Imam Fozani says, it is prohibited for one in a state of minor or major ritual impurity to touch the, uh, the exalted or the glorious book of the Quran unless with something that prevents direct contact. For Allah the exalted says, وَلَا يَمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَهَرُونَ None touch it except the purified. That is, it is prohibited to touch it unless by those purified from minor and major ritual impurity, according to the opinion that the words, the purified in the verse, refer to human beings. So he's giving you the ikhtilaf, the difference in the, in the meaning between the scholars of fiqh. Because some of them, they say, al-mutahharun, uh, uh, that those people, the, the purified ones, uh, are the, uh, refers to human beings. Another group of the scholars says it refers to the malaika, that you'll find this in some of the tafsir, that some of the salaf said that this refers to the malaika, to the angels. And so there's where you get the difference with the ruling, with the hukum. Right. So he says, uh, however, there are some Mufassirin, uh, those people who explain the Quran, who state that the words are purified in the aforementioned verse refer to the noble angels. Even if the verse is interpreted that the words the purified refer to the angels, they also refer to human beings by implication. So he's saying that the meaning is general, that it refers to if it if, as we take some of the Mufassirin from the Salaf, who said that it refers, uh, the, the purified ones, refers to the angels, he says that it's general. So that can include both angels and human beings. Uh, they also refer to human beings by implication. To illustrate, it was mentioned in the letter sent by Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to the people of Yemen, as narrated by Amr ibn Hazm, that no one should touch the book of Allah unless they are pure, related by a Nisa'i and the compilers of Hadith with a continuous chain of transmitters. Uh, transmitters. In addition, Ibn Abdul Bar, Rahimahullah Ta'ala said, this Hadith is more likely to be a mutawatir, 
uh, continuously recurrent uh, hadith as it is commonly accepted by the scholars. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, states that the prohibited, uh, the prohibition of touching the book of the Quran while being in a state of major or minor ritual impurity is agreed upon by the four Imams. Ibn Hubayra also states in, in his book entitled Al-Ifsah that they, meaning the four Imams, agree that it is impermissible for one in a state of ritual impurity to touch the book, uh, uh, to touch the Quran. However, one in a state of ritual impurity is allowed to hold the book of Allah, uh, the Quran, in a cover or a bag so as not to touch it directly. So meaning that some of uh, uh, that the scholars mentioned, uh, that some of them mentioned that you can use a cover. And this is why you have some women in the scholars, uh, some of the scholars make fatwa and say, for example, women who are memorized of the Quran and she or she's maybe a half of the Quran or she knows something of the Quran and it is necessary that she does not forget. She needs to keep, uh, you know, reading the Quran and reading from the, from the Kitab, then it is permissible for her with gloves or with a cover on the Quran because then she's not directly touching the Quran in a state of uh, in a state of impurity, meaning that she's on her menses. This is what we're talking about. If a woman's in her menses or she is a karmakamallah, she has a postpartum bleeding, then uh, some of the scholars, some of the scholars make fatwa that she can hold it, you know, with gloves because it, 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 it's in a situation where it's kind of a necessity so she doesn't forget. Or maybe she's a Quran teacher or whatever the case may be. Right. However, one in a state of ritual impurity is allowed to hold the book of, uh, of Allah in a cover or bag so as not to touch it directly. Similarly, one in a state of impurity is allowed to read or browse through the book without touching it. So you could have it and read it without touching it. Perhaps with new devices now, with the computers and so forth, uh, that would not be considered touching it as well. So that would be another alternative. Uh, the second thing that you cannot do when you're in a state of impurity is offering prayer. Of course, and we all know this, neither the obligatory nor the nawafil, the extra prayers. Scholars uniformly agree, there's consensus, that it is impermissible for one in a state of minor or major ritual impurity to perform prayer at all, be it obligatory or uh, the nawafil, provided one is able to purify oneself. Uh, this is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, O you who believe, when you rise to form prayer, wash your faces and your forearms to the elbows and wipe over your heads and wash your feet to the ankles. And if you are in a state of janaba, then purify yourselves. And this is in Surah al maida the verse of Wudu. So that shows us that uh, that is also something which is prohibited and by consensus, uh, by and first and foremost by Nas. Besides the Prophet is as related by Muslim and other compilers of Hadith, Allah does not accept a prayer without purific purification. The Prophet said, La Allah that Allah does not accept uh, the prayer of any one of you if he has hadith, meaning he has impurity. He's either past gas, he's urinated, or he has the major impurity. Well, in this Hadith, it's referring to the minor impurity that you can make uh, you can make wudu uh, to purify yourself. Until he makes wudu. So, uh, and the Prophet والسلام, also said, and this is a hadith that he's mentioned, Allah does not accept the prayer of any one of you if he passes wind, urine, or stool until he performs the ablution. Uh, the above hadith shows that it is impermissible for one to pray whilst being in a state of impurity, provided one is able to purify oneself. Thus, the prayer offered by one in a state of impurity is invalid, whether it is performed in such a state while one is aware of the ruling or not. So if one does it by accident or they do it on purpose, it is unaccepted. It is not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in fact, they will gain a sin if they do it intentionally because that means they're playing with the deen. Meaning if they know the hukum, if they know the ruling and they do it intentionally, they pray, pray, pray in a state where they are not 
uh, on Tahara, then this they will actually incur sin because they it's a, as if they're playing with the deed. And some of the scholars even have a stronger fatwa about that that maybe uh, you know a person who's playing with the deed in this matter has fallen into kufr disbelief. So it shows you it's very serious. So if you know you not you're not on purity, do not pray. Uh, And Imam Fozan, he also says, just to uh, elaborate, he says, but if one is unaware of it, meaning they're unaware of the, this ruling, and offers prayer in, 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 uh, without being conscious about this hukum, one in this case is not regarded as a sinner. They haven't got a sin, yet their prayer is invalid. Their prayer is unaccepted. The, sec the third uh, thing which is prohibited is make a tawaf around the Kaaba. Okay. It is impermissible for one in a state of minor or major ritual impurity to perform tawaf. For the Prophet wasallam said, tawaf is a prayer. Uh, it, tawaf is a prayer. The difference is that Allah made it lawful to speak during it. Okay? So tawaf, when you're making tawaf, it is like salat. So it requires that shart, that one condition of salat that we're really focusing on, and that is tahara, that's purification. It requires that you are free from the major and minor impurities. Uh, among the proofs that one is in a state of major ritual impurities prohibited to perform tawaf is the following Quranic reverse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem, O you will believe, do not approach prayer while you are intoxicated until you know what you are saying or in a state of or in a state of Janaba. Except those passing through uh, you know, a place of prayer until you have washed your whole body. So meaning that when you're, uh, you have janaba, you need to ghusl. You need to wash yourself before you can pray. Uh, this verse means that one should never enter a mosque while being in a state of major ritual impurity, except for those who are passing through it on their way. Since one in a state of janaba is prohibited to stay in a mosque, then with greater reason, one in the same state is prohibited to perform tawaf. Okay, so that's a fayda, to know that when you have the major hadith al-akbar, you are either in your menses, or the one, or a woman who is uh, postpartum bleeding, or, uh, you know, they have janaba, they, you know, akram Allah, they had relations, or they, you know, uh, ejaculated akram Allah, then this, this person also should not be in the masjid. Okay, uh, and again, uh, as far as a fatwa, just as another faida, the ulama mentioned, for example, women who are like serious tulab al or whatever, and they want to uh, sit in the, uh, you know, uh, a scholar and alim is 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 um, has a lecture, and the woman wants to attend the daughter, so wants to attend the lecture. That if she is wearing, of course, because in this day and age, you can do it without making. Uh, making the masjid messy, akramakum Allah, the woman can wear pads and things like this to protect uh, from, you know, getting the masjid filthy. So in, in that case, out of a necessity, because she's not just sitting in the masjid, just sitting there, but she's going for a spe specific purpose. She wants to benefit. Some of the scholars say for this reason, that because she's not, the illa is removed, that she's going to uh, harm, you know, maybe there's some wasakh in the masjid, you know, filth would be in the masjid, then in this case, out of a necessity, she could attend the dars. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Uh, deeds prohibited for one in a state of major ritual impurity in particular. So this is if you have the major, for example, as we mentioned, uh, menstruation and, and things like this. As for the specifically prohibited for the one in the state of the major ritual impurity, many things that require ghusl, or sexual impurities, as we mentioned, reciting the Quran. Uh, one in a state of the major ritual impurities prohibited to recite the Quran according to the following hadith related by Tirmidhi and other compilers of hadith on the authority of Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, nothing prevented him, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from reciting the Quran other than being in a state of janaba, uh, major ritual impurity. Uh, and as we mentioned, this is the, this uh, uh, hadith, uh, this is the wording of Tirmidhi. So this is a, a Tirmidhi. And the aforesaid hadith is as follows. 
he sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to recite the Quran for us unless he was in a state of janabah. Uh, so that's a, another hadith. This proves that it is prohibited for the person in a state of major ritual impurity to recite the Quran. The same ruling applies to both menstruating women and a woman in a state of postnatal bleeding. And so then now he's going to give you the istithna. So here's a nut, actually. And uh, the, this poll, the ones who say, he said, yet some scholars such as Shaykh al-Salam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimullah ta'ala, maintain that it is permissible for a menstruating woman to recite the Quran for fear of forgetting it. So that's where uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah is one of those imams of the religion who made fatwa and said if the woman is fearful of forgetting then she can recite the Quran and she should also, uh, you know, she can't touch the Quran directly without, you know, wearing the gloves and covers, and, you know, covering the Quran. Uh, and he said, uh, it is permissible for one in a state of major ritual impurity to use the wording of the Quran with no intention of reciting it. Uh, rather, as a way of remembrance of Allah, such as saying, in the name of Allah, the entirely, uh, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Uh, and all praises due to Allah, Lord of the world. So if they say that, but they're not actually reading and reciting the Quran, then it is permissible. There are are many examples of that. This is illustrated in the following hadith narrated by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to mention Allah in all of, on all conditions. So letting us know we can still make dhikr even when we're uh, in Janaba and so forth. The second uh, thing that the major uh, impurities uh, prohibit is, for example, staying in the masjid. It is pro prohibited for one in whatever state of major ritual impurity be it janaba, menstruation, or postnatal bleeding to stay in a masjid unless one performs ablution. Ah, so that's beautiful. Uh, he mentioned, so that there's a condition there, that if one is in that state of major impurity, if they make ablution, you know, they make wudu, that doesn't remove the major impurity, but it makes it muhaffafa. You know, it makes it a lighter. And that's because we have the Leo from the Sunnah for this. And from the book of the Sunnah. Uh, and that's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh, you have believed, do not approach prayer while you are intoxicated until you know what you're saying or in a state of janaba, except those passing through a place of prayer until you have washed uh, your body. This means that the one in a state of major ritual impurity is prohibited to enter a masjid to stay therein. In addition, in the hadith read by Abu Dawood, on the authority of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, graded as sahih, a uh, hadith by Ibn Khuzayma, the Prophet Sallallahu said, I do not deem the masjid lawful for a menstruating woman or for a person in a state of Janaba. However, if one in a state of major ritual impurity performs ablution, it is permissible for one then to stay at the mosque as Atha reported. So this is beautiful. So we see that the asal is no, it's impermissible. But if you make wudu, we have, and we have delil to show that. It's not just Someone made a fatwa because they, you know, uh, on their rai, on their rai, on their opinion. But instead, uh, Atha reported, uh, he said, uh, Rahimullah ta'ala, I saw some of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam staying at the masjid while being in a state of janaba only after performing the ablution for prayer. So they had janaba and they were in the masjid, but they only remained there because they made wudu. The significance of performing ablution here, though one is in a state of janaba, is lessening. As I said, takhfif or mukhafif is lessening the state of janaba so as to make it permissible to stay at the masjid. Likewise, it is permissible for one in a state of janaba to pass through the masjid without staying therein. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, except those passing through a place of prayer. Uh, that is, one in such a state is only allowed to pass through it for the sake of mere passing. Whenever there's an exceptional case of a certain prohibition, it is deemed permissible. So being a passerby is an exceptional case of the general ruling stated by the hadith of the, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu which goes, I do not make the mosque lawful for a menstruating woman or for a person who is in Janaba. He said, I do not make the masjid lawful for a menstruating woman or for a person who is in Janaba. So that shows us the base that is not permissible. Similarly, 
it is prohibited for the one in a state of major ritual purity without even without even being in a state of ablution to be present at the place of performing uh, the Eid. Uh, yet it is permissible for one to pass through it for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says menstruating women should keep away from the place of performing the prayer so they can go to the Eid but they should the place where the, the Musalla where the people pray you know on the on the ground and, and stuff like that the women should not be there but they should be you know off to the side or you know away from where the people pray and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said was correct. Allah Azza wa Jalla. Anything I said that was incorrect. So myself, Shaitan, Wassalamu alaikum. Ala Nabi Muhammad.